Well, hello and welcome to another one of our Ball State webinars. Um, we have with us today Lexi and Lizzie from our Ball State Practicum um, Counseling Clinic. And they're going to work talk to us about time management. And if you have any questions, please um, put them in the chat. I'll monitor the chat and there'll be time at the end as well if you wanna ask them your own way. So I'll go ahead and turn that over to you all. Okay, so hi everyone. It's really um, a beautiful day out if you look out the window. And today we, Lexi and me, we're going to present about time management. I understand it's been pretty stressful semester and maybe even more stressful for us moving toward the end of the semester. And I also understand like a lot of, of us want to know some tips about like time management and maybe some like future tools or everything that can be used for time management. So today, Lexi and me, we're definitely going to go through about like what's important for time management and how we're gonna to make use of uh, something, knowledge or tools that can benefit us at down the way. So let's move to the first slide. This is actually a pretty good online tool to just, if you look down to the, uh, the bottom, there is the, um, the, the website, the link that you want, if you are interested in, you can go to there and uh, do this uh, self survey. So basically it will ask us like, well, where does my time go? And uh, you will see there are different categories for example, how much we, we, use, we use the time for our sleep or how much time we use for our grooming activity and how much time we use for clean up, clean up our apartment and how much time are we gonna use for doing errands. So like for, by doing all these calculations, you actually would be surprisingly finding that we are using most of the time to as a multi, like multitaskers and we leave really limited time for ourselves to achieve our goals or to even take care of ourselves. So this is really a good reminder. If like we are doing this like a seminar or webinar like in person, I will definitely encourage you to open this link, to open this website, to do this little exercise. But like, remember the link? And if you want to search, you can search the ferries.edu and also using the where does my time go and you can find this survey online and try them out. You will, you will be surprised. So after this, I'm just like want to point out that actually sometimes we don't even have enough time for sleep. We don't have time. We don't we feel like we don't have enough time for schoolwork because we, we probably use those time for other places. And how would that really making like our social function or academic function, like make that difficulty for us? It will be down to the next slide. Uh, let's see, can you move to the next slide? Yep. So some as aspects that if like we are feeling difficult, like in managing time, here might be some that we can think about. For example, some like meeting academic or work, work deadlines. Like, wow, my, my timeline, like there are several deals for me tomorrow and I'm just half of them. That really like, not just like anxiety provoking, but also it's like, I don't even know I can make it, right? So, and sometimes it's like, well, I find it's difficult for me to keeping like efficient workflow. It's like, I'm easily distracted. I wanna do A, I wanna do B and I wanna do C, but at the end of the day, I just probably did nothing that can happen too. So like keeping an efficient workflow is sometimes make me feel difficult. And for example, like improving work quality, it's like, because I have such limited time, I see it. It's like, I just can barely make the work. I would probably sacrifice my work uh, like quality because of that. And because I feel like, yeah, as I said, like 
I don't even have enough time to complete the, the task, whether I can complete it. It can increase our stress level. It can increase our like emotion level, like in managing those stress. So like, like feeling like not having enough time that do make us feel difficult on that. And at the same time, it's like thinking about like professional reputation. If, if that's related to the goal, the career goal you wanna go, you wanna build up a good professional re reputation. But some, it's like, okay, if I can just barely make the work done, it's, it's really hard to maintain a good professional like reputation, right? Because that's probably related to your work quality and also your social interaction with your peers or with your supervisors. So that can be some a little bit difficult. And also like about motivations, like because I'm so struggling for the time management, I'm not motivated anymore, either for my work or my school work. It's like, I know it's like, I'm struggling for time. I, I'm not motivated in doing anything. That can be really difficult for us. And in thinking about like what time, time management really is, the next slide can tell us about what time management is. So, Basically, if we think about like time management, there are two key components. One is about how our cognition, how our mind are functioning. That will be cognitive functioning. Another part is like skills to help us to achieve or manage the complex behaviors that's involved in along the way. So in thinking about like, and for our presentation today, we're going to have several focus. The first one is under cognitive functioning is about how we're gonna organize and plan the use of our time. And the second would be how our emotion, how our emotion regulation can play a very important role in managing our time. And the third part would be the basic some skills that we can use or apply to manage those tasks or, and, or make us become more like multitask functioning. And so basically time management is, is to make effective use of time in goal-directed activities in daily life within the time allotted. So here is a thing that I, I would like to emphasize is about like a goal-directed. That is really, ties back to what you wanna do and how we gonna organize and plan on them and put them into actions. So the next slides, we're gonna to start from like goal and into details to talk about like the organization and planning. Yeah, let's see like how we can prioritize to set up our goals and prioritize those like steps or tasks that related to our goal. The step one might be to start to think about like your goals and priorities. We can break them down into different time frame. For example, your long term goals, your five year goals, and your six months goals. So, what would be some like examples for long term goals? It might be a broad an umbrella like goal for you what you want your life to be. For example, I wanna have a family or the family would look like I'm gonna have a partner and some children, or I wanna have a good income, or I, want, I just wanted to be healthy. That will be my life goal or long-term goal. And starting from the long-term goal, we can break it down to a little bit more concrete into bring it to five-year goals. For example, in order to achieve having a good income, I'm going to complete my education. That will be a five-year goal. Or in order to have a good income, I'm going to, or in order to be healthy, I want to find a job that gives me meaning. Or in order to have a family, I'm planning to, to find a partner like in five years and get married. So that's all tied back to your long-term goals. And 
five year goals, how about six months goals? What would be those look like? For example, in thinking about we're now at the end of, uh, of the winter uh, or like um, the fall four semester. If in thinking like looking into our spring semester, that might be a six month, like or half year, like a framework. What are we gonna do? It's like, okay, I'm going to complete the spring semester. That will be tied to you, you are going to complete your education, right? And, uh, or you, you wanna go to get some working experience that's related to find a job that's meaningful to you. And you can make it as your six month goal. Or we can think about like save up and buy a gift for yourself. But what does that matter to our other goals of us? It can be an incentive, for example, to our education or to our meaningful life. Or through this process, we can see some opportunities to make ourselves a better person. So these will be a more concrete, as you can tell, like from the long term to five year and to six months, they becomes more concrete to you and can become like every day, probably every day, somehow a small step or like concrete actions for you. If we move to the next slide, you will see it's really important as what, what I've been doing is like to find connections between your goal. Give, for example, again, to make a good income. That was a long-term goal for you. If that's a long-term goal for you, it probably can link to your five-year um, your five-year plan is like to find a job that gives you meaning. And if that can either break, be break down to a six month goal as like to successfully complete the semester. So finding connections between the short-term goals and your long-term goals will be helpful for you to take actions. The next slide. Then step three, it's like, Yes, Lizzie, I'm listening to you. It's like, it seems like you have to connect all your goals. And what about the rest? Here we go. It's like, we need to, again, break down the long-term goals into smaller, more achievable mini, mini goals. For example, starting from like to successfully complete the semester. This, will, this is the six month goal. And then we're gonna break them down to one month goals and one week goals. For example, like for one month, if I look into my uh, calendar of this semester or the coming spring semester, I know like academically, I gonna have on, for example, on January, I gonna have eight assignments or like on February, I gonna have eight assignments and two tests. Careerly, I wanna make a plan for about like making applications for some part-time jobs. And my goal is like, maybe I make eight applications through, throughout the month. And in order to make me feel like healthy and live a meaningful life, I wanna have a healthy lifestyle. I wanna, for example, set up some uh, goals for me for exercise, for a healthy diet that as my monthly goal. And then don't forget to reward yourself. Self-rewarding is really important. Through what? For example, like, okay, throughout this month, I probably am going to meet my great friends group twice and have two game nights. Okay, if that's one month go, Let's go again to break it into one week goals. And then it will, might be like, okay, I see for this week, I have the two major assignments and the one test. And I, for my career part, I probably, I just wanna pre prepare my re resume and uh, search the job information. And for my health part, I set up two times for my gym time to work out and I self-prepare my meals to eat healthier. And then I'm gonna have one friend's night. That's my week goal. So basically you can tell like from a grand 
blueprint, lifelong goal, you're gonna bring them, break them down to a concrete steps that you can just see it and do it. And you know, they are connected to your life goal. So this is how we are going to do like goal setting and prioritization. And moving forward to the next slide. A lot of us are talking with me. It's like, I'm procrastinating again. It's like, oh, I can't do it. We have a lot of resistance on it. I hear you, cause that's me too. And we really wanted to know like why we can't have the procrastination, right? So let's break it down to see what can contribute to our procrastination. There are five big fives, let's say. So for example, fear of failure. It's like a lot of us would feel like, yeah, I have, I'm a perfectionism person. It's like, I either want to do it perfectly or I don't want to do it at all. I would better just like contemplate, contemplating it without taking any action, action. Or like some people would feel like double insurance. It's like, um, what if I, fe I feel it? Like how I can make it sure that I am, I'm pretty sure I'm going to achieve it. And then it's like throughout this, like, thought like struggling we're actually letting the time go it's like we're not doing anything but just like struggling with our thoughts and that's how we're losing the time right instead of like manage our time that is related to our goals and the second one would be like fear of success success or afraid it's like it's like okay if i success like what what can that be it's like I don't, I don't know it. It's, it's so like, so, so much things that unknown that can make us feel like, mm, I'm not ready for that. Or it's like, okay, I can push it a little bit far away. I can leave it later until the last minute. And that will be anxiety provoking again. So another one would be like losing control. It's like, Oh, what if I like alone doing this? It's like, what if I just set up too much things? I'm so overwhelming. Like, I don't know how to do it. And uh, I don't feel like I'm controlling the tasks. It's like all of the, the goals, the things that's like controlling me instead of me as the master controlling what I'm doing. And that again, it's like a, an emotional battling and thoughts battling that keeps away from doing things and fear of separation. So sometimes we really, we need companies. We are people and we are people animal, right? We always would be enjoying a little bit company. Some of us will feel like I need some alone time. I need some people time, but in general, we will have some time. We need the, a company, but like, because of like, I'm just, I just like separate with my friends who usually will be my strong emotion support. And now she's not there. I'm so don't know how to deal with that piece, that separation. And that will take away our ability to manage our time too. And for example, like fear of attachment, this, this can be seen like for kids who, who are, who are so like, so maybe see like uh, attached to their parents and like by leaving their parents, it's like, okay, can't do anything. And the at attachment can be a person, but can also become like other forms of attachment. You can be so attached to a way in doing things. And like, if you are just like jump out of that, like way in doing things, you feel like lost. It's like, uh, I don't know how to, how to do things that I'm not used to. And that will also put us in a, in a time like that, like we are more emotionally and uh, like cognitively overwhelmed rather than like we can really calm down and work on the, the cases or like the tasks that we need to. So like these big five are some commonly seen like procrastination, like, um, like a country, contributors to our procrastination. 
And also want to point out is that the mental health issues or the mental health uncomfortability can also impact our way or like our cognitive capacity in doing things. For example, if we feel like really down through the time, which is like, we don't wanna do anything. And we felt like we just wanna cry or we just wanna get to sleep, even though we don't have a good quality of sleep, but we don't, we're not motivated in doing things. And what we're losing interest in doing things. Or the, it, might, it can be really like serious or severe like depression that makes us feel like we are just so soaked into the, like our mental health piece and forgetting about the world. And for anxiety, it will be another story. It's like, I'm so frightened or like, I'm so restless, I cannot focus. It's like, I cannot focus in the moment. Even though I see like I have a long list to do, I see anything, any of them as a stimulus to my anxiety rather than something I can focus on it. I can just uh, calm myself in doing that. And that definitely is gonna to impact our cognition like uh, or cognitive capacity in doing things too. And there are other like um, many other more. And we, for every hour of us, it might be a different reason. And um, there might be something you feel like, okay, that might be me. For example, fear of unknown, fear of changes, fear, a uh, lack of assert, assert, assertion and uh, poor study habits. And there, are, there can be a lot of things. So I would encourage all of you to take a look at this slide and figure out which one or which, which several you would resonate on. And then starting from there, we're gonna, we can figure out some strategies that we can use to manage those contributor or factors. And let's move to the next slide. So again, it's like, okay, Lizzie, you talk about so many like possibilities or factors that can contribute to it. And how, what I gonna do with it? How to manage procrastination. Step one, identify the procrastinated task, avoidance behaviors, or the cues for your avoidance behaviors. For example, like we can, like for in, look into details, it's like which tasks have you noticed that are more susceptible to your procrastination? It's about all about you. So we're gonna do it to learn about ourselves again. For example, it's like, mm, I know I'm recently into um, a show. I know like at that time, like for example, Wednesday night at eight, I have to watch it. And that might be like a thing that blocked me away from an hour in doing things. I somehow need to notice what, which tasks are like more susceptible to my procrastination. Or it's like, I always want to watch more shows and that can take time consuming and I just don't know to stop it. And we need to identify some of our habit in our behaviors. So like, and then it's definitely make it clear that what do you do instead of the task? For example, like I have on like Wednesday at eight, I have to do, I have to watch the show. But on um, the midnight, I actually have a like five page paper due. And then it's like, like watching the eight o'clock show is giving me one hour short in completing the five page the five page paper, and that is a distractor for me. So basically what is, is that we need to figure out who, what will be those things that can procrastinate us on or some cues that can become an avoidance behavior to us. This is step one. And step two would be like identify and replace procrastinating distorted beliefs. For example, it's like, mm, re, 
to replace these beliefs, for example, like develop a realistic task-oriented statement to combat them. It's like, okay, Lizzie, I know you are so into shows and you enjoy it. That's a good self-rewarding thing. And uh, we also need to think better about the priority again. And we need to make some, I'm talking with myself. It's like, okay, I'm going to make an agreement with myself. Like I know Wednesday night eight, that sounds wonderful for a show. And I also know I have a, a, an assignment due. So I will probably just plan another time during the weekend to do it and enjoy it, but leave the time for myself to complete my assignment. So basically it's more about like a conversation with yourself to, to replace some beliefs like I have to do it at that time instead of replace them like to negotiate with, with yourself about more time to do the things that you need to do and another time to do things with a like a lower priority. Again, it's like, it's not easy, but it's more about like practice. Practice one time, it doesn't work. We practice twice. And as long as we practice more, it can become a habit for us to manage our time and also later get some self-rewarding. So after step two, what are we gonna do? It will be on the next slide. Again, like environment is very important. So like create a task conducive environment is super important. For example, if I just leave the television on at 8, p 8 p.m. and just sitting in front of the television, it's most probably that I'm going to watch the show, right? So how are we going to do it in a more task conducive environment is up to you to set up your own learning environment. For example, it should be an environment read of the avoidance behavior. It, that is like, okay, I know it's five page paper. I'm avoiding it. I don't want to do it. I don't, I don't feel like in a mood on it, but rather create an environment with all the positive cues that can make you feel like, okay, I'm preparing myself ready for the paper and I'm starting doing it. For example, if for me, it's like, I always would like a cup of tea aside of me and I would turn on my light to certain like lightness and with a comfortable chair and uh, except for the page that I'm going to work on, I'm going to close all the browsers, all the pages. And that's a way that works with me, but that might not a way that works with you. So it's very important for you to figure out what would be the task conducive environment for you. And the fourth step is like establish a contract for completing the target task and make sure to always have a backup plan, which means it's like, we always know like, okay, at this date, at this time, I gonna have these things to get done, right? And I, but I also leave some room for myself to flexibly manage it. For example, for a long, let's say the five page task, some people would find it also, again, it's very personalized tasks. For me, for a five page, I probably will take like two to three hours to really complete it. And for some people, it's probably I just take one hour. But always think about leave some room to complete it. If I think like I need three to four hours, okay. And it dues on Wednesday midnight. And I probably start to have it on Sunday to try the first time, see how much I can complete. And I leave another time blocked for the, the other half. I may need it, I may not need it, but always have a backup plan, especially for some big and important projects, right? And that can improve not only how well you get it done, but also like how you feel and your emotional level 
not make you feel like so hasty and anxious or even feel sad about not be on your own pace. So always leave some room. That is actually very beneficial to finding your own pace in doing things. And don't forget to reward yourself. That's very important because you made it, you need to reward yourself. So that's step four. And I think now I can pass it to Lexi to talk about something more. All right, thank you, Lizzie. Hi, everyone. So Lizzie touched on the connection between anxiety and emotion regulation a little bit. So this is where we're really gonna dive in and then also give you all some subsequent um, strategies to really help improve um, emotion dysregulation rather um, amid moments where time management is not so not so easy. So first diving into anxiety, I mean, whether it is difficulties getting things done, so problems with managing your time or whatnot, when we're feeling anxious, so maybe tense, maybe having thoughts run through our mind, um, difficulty concentrating, that is likely gonna provoke some pretty strong emotions that are both unhelpful and are really gonna make doing what you um, have in front of you, so crossing off the list of objectives, it's gonna make it even more challenging for you. So when we are unable to control our emotions that might derive from anxiety, as I mentioned, that's dysregulation. So flipping that, emotion regulation is all about being able to manage or control emotions that surface um, and doing so in a way that is both socially appropriate, but is also gonna be conducive to you doing what you need to do in your daily life, whether that's homework or going to work or, and whatnot. So the first technique that we have here for you is deep breathing. So I, I do want to kind of back up because I know in moments of stress when people are like, oh, just breathe through it. It's like, okay, yeah, I get it. I breathe. We all do. We, we need to breathe to survive. But when we add some structure to breathing and we can deep breathe, this is going to be a very effective way to make ourselves less anxious and more grounded in the moment. So below... We have this picture of a breathing technique that I'll walk you through. And I, I really wanna point out that this is a simplistic and effective um, strategy for breathing. And it's going to be very, very helpful when it comes to being able to kind of hone in those emotions, manage them in a way that's more helpful for you. And this is something that you can do alone. It's something that you can do in public, in a crowd of people, and you can do it for as long as you need. So with that, We'll start with this, what, what you see below. So you inhale for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, and then exhale for six. So if, we, if we're all gonna do this together, it's kind of go something like this. So hold it and then exhale. Okay, that's all there is to it. So putting intention into your inhaling, holding it, and then exhaling for that six seconds. And by doing so, we are forcing oxygen into our bodies, which is going to make us less anxious. And when our minds are focused on these counting, we're placing any potential racing thoughts, we're placing that into, into this technique because we're focused on doing this in, a right, in the right way. Um, so this is one technique that is going to be the most helpful, again, something that I just love about this is that you can be doing this and no one has to know. You could be in a classroom, you could be in your car. Um, it's just something that is really quick and easy that you can just put in your back pocket. Moving on. So the next component um, that I really wanna speak to right now with anxiety is that we often walk around with muscle tension and we don't even know it especially now, I, I'm not sure about anyone else in this um, who's participating today, but I am working a lot from home. So all of my work is remote. So instead of in between classes or whatnot, you know, maybe walking around, socializing, you know, I'm kind of sitting in one place. And especially during finals week, when we are busy trying to get things done, we tend to just power through our work. And we don't even know that we are carrying so much stress, so much tension in our neck or in our backs. 
um, or in a variety of different places. And so through doing this muscle, sorry, progressive muscle relaxation technique, this is not only going to call attention to where we're feeling tense, but it's going to help us relieve some of that anxiety. So what we want to do is tense. So if we're, if we're tense in our hands or maybe in our shoulders or neck, we'll do that shoulders and neck. You know, what we want to first do is tense it up a lot and then slowly relax. And by doing this, and you, and you do it a few times too, and by doing that, you get a sense of what your body feels like when it is tense. And nine times out of 10, it's not gonna feel great, right? It's gonna feel uncomfortable and, and you can get a sense of, okay, when I am anxious, this is what I do. Or when I'm stressed, this is what I do. And when we are able to understand what our bodies feel like when we're tense, we're better able to intentionally focus on relaxing or, you know, softening those muscles. And in addition to this muscle, um, progressive muscle relaxation technique, this is also going to give us a sense of, okay, what do I need to be doing maybe in between my hours of powering through whatnot? What can I do in order to, you know, prevent um, my, my muscles from becoming super tense? So does that mean maybe going on a quick walk? Does it mean, you know, getting up and stretching? Maybe that means running to the next room and grabbing a cup of coffee or a glass of water. But really the whole point of this is to know that a lot of times when we are stressed out, we get anxious and when we're anxious, we get tense. And when we get tense, that's not gonna really help us um, as we're trying to complete tasks. Because again, that's likely gonna surface a lot of emotions that just aren't helpful for us. So when we pay more attention to our, um, our, our tense muscles, we're gonna be um, quicker to, to, to put more effort into relaxing. So that is another technique that you all can utilize in moments of stress or even before stress. You know, it's a good practice to get a sense of what our bodies are feeling um, and, and try to relax them a little bit more. Next, in coping with anxiety, um, I, we introduced the RC, REC or the REC technique. So the premise of this is to acknowledge that, okay, our thoughts, our emotions, our surroundings, our social interactions, they're all over, they're all overlapping. There's some kind of interwoven relationship between these different concepts, right? And so when we are feeling a different way, or when we're feeling a certain way that might not be the most effective in that moment, we can we can utilize um, our surroundings or our thoughts in order to change that. So kind of breaking that down a little bit, we can start with how we're feeling. So just coming up with a, a, a random example, if I'm feeling, you know, a little stressed, bummed, frustrated about having to complete an assignment that's due in a few days, I can call attention to this emotion that's coming up for me. Next, we're going to move on to thoughts. Okay, what thoughts are going to be associated with that feeling of frustration or maybe like some slight depression and anxiety when it comes to, you know, having to complete this assignment? So a thought could, for me in this situation, could be like, oh my gosh, this is gonna take so much time. Ugh. So with that too, so those are kind of like the words, the images would be, you know, maybe I'm you know, envisioning myself working at my desk all weekend long while I, you know, I, I could be something more fun or the memory like, oh, I remember last finals week, I had to do this and it was so stressful. So those are an example of different things that can come to mind in the second step. Third, we'll move on to events, whether this is in the past, present, and future. And that kind of ties in with what I was talking about with maybe thinking back to, oh, well, last finals week, it was this. Well, you can also think in the future too. Okay, you know, was it was it so bad? You know, after, after I, I submitted my paper, thinking back, was that experience so bad? So it's really just, again, tying in all of these different components that go in this feeling for that for um, this technique, but then for the third step, going to events. Next, we're gonna go to the evaluative component. We're gonna evaluate that thought. So my thought was, oh, this is gonna take me so long, I don't wanna do this, right? So we're gonna see, we're gonna evaluate this, like, hmm, is this helpful? Is this intense? Is this thought serving me? Well, is it not serving me? So paying attention to how, how is this going to impact you? 
Next, we move on to the change component of the technique. Okay, so in the last step, I evaluated the thought and I decided, okay, it's not helpful for me to just be in the state of, oh, this is gonna not be fun to do. I don't wanna do this. So an alternative, um, you wanna think of an alternative thought that is going to be more helpful for you. So for me, if I'm changing this thought, it's going to be something like, okay, maybe it's not the most fun, but that is a way for me to maybe prove my knowledge in this class. Maybe it's more helpful to think along the lines of, you know what? This is um, my assignment that after I turn it in, I'm done. Or maybe for me, it's like, wait, I know I don't wanna do this, but I have time. I have a few days, I can plan ahead. I can use some of our time management techniques that Lizzie showed us to apply that um, to this assignment. And then in doing that, let's go back to this emotional um, component and, and, and think, okay, what am I feeling now that I changed the thought? Maybe I'm feeling less bummed out, less frustrated, maybe more hopeful, maybe more motivated um, to really get this done. So that's kind of a series of, of, of different steps that you can go to, to from starting with, oh, I'm not feeling great to, huh, I'm feeling more hopeful. So that's what we can do to better manage our, our, our emotions and then in turn manage our anxiety. So with that, we'll move on. Check the time here. Okay, we're doing good. Okay, so our next coping strategy for managing our anxiety through controlling our emotions is really tuning into imagery. So if you look out um, your window as I am right now and you know my my leaf, my, my trees don't have leaves on them, you know, it's a bright day. Um, but still, you know, I, I'm kind of just staring at my neighbor's house. That's not the best imagery, right? It's not really gonna relax me. But when I think about something that does make me feel relaxed or makes me feel maybe even more happy or hopeful, you know, I, I can think of the beach, I can think of some of the trips I've went on or a picture from, or like a, an image from a movie I've seen. And you really want to bring yourself fully into those moments. And you can do so by, by uh, closing your eyes and thinking of this very calming and positive image. And while you're doing that, you wanna immerse yourself as much as possible. So you really want to try to utilize your senses to really put yourself in that calming space. And so ask yourself, what do you see, you know? What, so if I'm on the beach, you know, I'm seeing the waves, I'm seeing the sand, maybe I'm seeing some um, children building sand castles, some pelicans flying in the distance. And then next, what do I hear? Maybe I hear the seagulls, maybe I hear the waves sloshing around, you know, maybe I hear uh, my friend, you know, running on the beach or, you know, coming to sit next to me or something, whatever is that calming, a nice positive uh, image for you. Next, you know, am I tasting anything? Am I am I on the on the beach? Maybe eating some fresh fruit, or maybe someone's making a barbecue, and I have a plate of whatever is next to me. You know, so what are some things eating or drinking wise that are enjoyable for you that fit that moment? Next, you know, what do I feel? You know, do I feel the grain of sand? Do I feel the waves running across my feet or maybe even the sun? Do I feel the sun on my skin? Next, maybe some smells. Um, you know, do I, do I smell, uh, now I'm trying to think of what you smell at the beach, but you know, am I smelling barbecue in the distance? Am I smelling um, what I, when I'm eating that's right in front of me? Do I maybe smell the sunscreen that I put on before? Um, so these different, so as I, as I produced a, the image of the beach, because that's relaxing for me, you all need to find that image that is relaxing for you. As Lizzie was saying, you know, managing your emotions or managing your time, it's really going to be a very personalized individual process. So really what works for me might not work for you. So really think about, you know, what is somewhere or something I've seen that's relaxing and, and can I bring myself there through tuning into my senses? Okay. And, you know, moving on from emotion regulation to these tools that you can utilize in order to better manage your time. So there are quite a few 
So this is not a comprehensive list, but with technology, there are so many different apps on your phone. I know for me, I have my calendars I through my, through my smartphone, but I also have a calendar through my email, um, as well as a variety of different organizational apps that you can look up and find whatever works for you. Um, some people use their notes to keep a list of, of the things that they want to accomplish. So technology, um, though we're on it quite often, it is, it is such a good thing that we have that can really better our, our management of our time. Next is calendars and schedules. So um, for me, and I'll, I'll show you all, I live by my planner. I order a two-year planner every single year and I stick to it because for me, Without it, I, I am not a great manager of my time. So when I am using my planner, I make those to-do lists for each day. I plan out when I have, you know, a big task, you know, I, I break it up into sections. Um, and these weekly or monthly or semester calendars, those are really going to help you remember different dates. Um, they're going to help you to um, know what you have for the different day and what you need to work on and maybe what you can, you know, move to a different day to work on. So it's a great way to really plan out your, your life and plan out your, your day or your week um, rather than keeping it all up here because that's, for, for some of us, um, keeping a mental schedule or mental planner, uh, it's very, very easy to forget things. Next, meeting with an advisor. So um, whether this is a mentor or really your advisor for school, um, they're going to be a helpful source of guidance for you in order to help you better manage your time. They can give you different techniques in organizing your semester schedule. They can help you arrange your schedule in a way that is going to make sense based on, you know, maybe the workload, the difficulty, um, and then maybe other things too. So not just school, but I know some of us, you know, have extracurricular activities or maybe have children or, or jobs. So meeting with your advisor can help you make your semester schedule in a way that makes sense for you. And then next, working with your therapist. So therapists, um, as Lizzie and I you know, offer counseling service, is we meet with our clients about a variety of different things. And time management is one of them. Um, this is, time management impacts our life. And so it makes sense to bring that concern into counseling and you can work with a therapist to help organize your schedule, again, in a way that makes sense for you. Um, so again, not a exhaustive list, but just a few things that you can really utilize in order to improve your time management skills. And next, I believe this is the last slide too. Um, you know, it's, it's very easy to get bogged down, you know, when we're in the thick of things such as finals week, there's a lot going on. So sometimes it's really important to kind of step back and, and, and really reflect on, okay, what is important to me? What do I value in life? And why do I value that? And by engaging in that personal reflection or personal exploration, we're going to be able to identify those values in our life that can act as a means to um, help us, I guess, organize our life in a way that is going to express those values. And so moving on to what Lizzie was talking about, the connection between life goals, five-year goals, six months goals, or the tasks that are at hand currently, you know, how do those tie back to those values? Does it make sense with what you're doing? Do those reflect your values? Um, and then moving on again, prioritizing the task. What is most important today versus tomorrow versus next week versus six months? Um, how are we going to prioritize our time in order to accomplish our objectives that are our most pressing? And when it comes to procrastination, acknowledging that we all procrastinate, we all have different reasons we procrastinate, what strategies are going to be effective for us as individuals to really push through that uh, procrastination wall and really get done what we need to get done. And as we know with our, our cell phones and laptops and TV, there's so many things in our world that serve as major distractors. So acknowledging what is a distractor and what is it, you know, is it okay if I have my phone on my desk or am I just gonna, you know, wanna pick it up and, and flip through a social media platform? Do I need to maybe take it into another room? Do I need to set a timer for an app? 
you know, for how much time I spend on different apps. So really making sure that limiting your distractions, and if you can't do that, and I, I acknowledge that this can be hard um, amid COVID, but being able to, um, if we can't eliminate our distractions, being able to relocate ourselves in a more, a less distracting um, environment. So, you know, for, for me, that might mean moving from a room where I do, you know, my things to maybe the kitchen table or maybe a different office space, or if time and, you know, uh, health allows going to the library. Um, next, learning to be flexible, giving yourself time. We are not meant to operate um, nonstop without any kind of breaks. You know, we are social creatures, as Lizzie mentioned. We need to be in connection with other people. We need to engage in things that are not so mentally draining and things that we just enjoy too. So being sure that you're really taking care of yourself while you're trying to manage your time. So while you're going through that planner, if that means scheduling, scheduling a break, that's what you gotta do. Um, and then last, acknowledging that we are less than perfect and knowing that we have to give ourselves grace when we're managing our time and trying to get things done. So sometimes we have to say no to different tasks and whether that is good or bad, but we just have to know that, you know, through managing our time, through checking things off our list, it's not gonna be perfect, but we can do different things to help us improve, um, manage our emotions, manage that anxiety, and also being intentional about rewarding yourself. You know, once you get something checked off your list instead of jumping onto another, okay, maybe you get a piece of candy, maybe you get a walk, maybe you get to watch a 20 minute show or, or whatever works for you. So all together, just knowing that time, in, time management is important and it's also important when you're managing your time to take care of yourself and to give yourself some compassion and grace while doing so. And I believe that is the end of our slideshow. So I will stop sharing. All right, well, thank you. That was very timely and needed, right? Since everyone's in finals or heading to finals. Um, does anyone on the call have any questions or comments? I don't see anything in the chat. Okay. All right, well, I will um, stop the recording, but before I do, um, I wanted to ask you all, is the Let's Talk service, is that starting already or not until spring? So that is that has started. If um, you all have any interest in Let's Talk, you can go to the Ball State University Counseling Practical Clinic page. There is you know, a, a, a list of tabs on the side. One of them is Ivy Tech students. Under IV Tech Students, there's a Let's Talk page and that just comes up. Um, you'll receive a link to how you can, you can just click on the link and it, it, it brings um, a counselor up that you can talk to. Um, and there's also a schedule. So it's not a 24 hour thing. Um, there's a set schedule with different times. Yeah. So, all so it's new and we haven't really um, sent that out to students yet. So you might just explain a little bit about what it is. Yep. Yeah. So Let's Talk is a one-time virtual, virtual um, kind of like a consultation or drop-in services. So if you maybe want to start counseling, but kind of have questions, want to know more about the process, if you need any kind of resource, if you need like advice or like guidance, you can hop on this link and meet with a counselor face to face, face to face, meaning, you know, um, through Zoom right now. Um, Sessions last probably 15-ish 15, 15 minutes. Um, so it's not like a, this hour session or anything, but it's just a place where you can get some um, tools, perspective, guidance, support, get some questions related to counseling answered for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight that because I know we're gonna start marketing that. Um, but for those of you on the call, it's, it's a nice opportunity that if you aren't sure you want to do a full hour session, you might be able to just to stop in, um, ask your questions, get a feel for what a session would be like, and then, you know, you can make your decision off of that. But it's going to be offered um, at different times, and um, it's real time, so when you're logging on, someone will be there, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So it's not making an appointment. It's when you log on, somebody's going to be there that you can talk to right then. So, all right. Well, thank you. Let me get this recording stopped. Thank you very much.